Welcome to part four of our HDMI modded console discussion being paired with the RetroTINK 4K and today we are discussing the one and only legendary PlayStation 2. So the PS2 is probably one of the more pointless systems to HDMI mod if you're trying to pair it with the RetroTINK 4K. Unlike other HDMI mods where you benefit from cleaner video and audio, the PS2 already includes a digital audio port, making this mod even more just kind of frivolous to the whole thing. So let's talk about setup. So for today's video, we are using my PS2 Slim here that has been modded with the Retro Gem, and we are comparing it to official Sony component cables as well as optical audio. So unfortunately, if you install the Retro Gem inside your PS2 Fats, you have just killed off your optical audio port, but on the Slim, we're able to make the comparison. The HDMI out and component out are then being fed to the RetroTINK 4K, and we're on the latest firmware for both devices. So now for a basic setup overview for the Retro Gem, if you are planning on using it with the RetroTINK 4K. So the Retro Gem now has two modes of operation, standalone and direct. Do not use it in standalone mode with the RetroTINK 4K. The deinterlacing options for the Retro Gem are still far behind what you get out of the RetroTINK 4K. And even a quick scroll through the menu can show you just how jittery everything looks. You also have to be careful of uneven pixel scaling if you aren't doing integers if you're not in direct mode. So heading into your retro gem settings, make sure you're on the latest firmware. Under video, go down to direct mode and switch it from standalone to direct. And that puts us in direct mode and as you can see things are a lot smoother. Now unfortunately even in direct mode the gem is cropping off a couple lines of pixels on the left side of the screen. So if we go into our retro tank menu here, under advanced settings and turn on scaling and cropping, the blue borders will help us adjust for this. So if we head into our gem menu here, go into video, shift, crop. If we adjust the horizontal, we could get it to appear like it's supposed to. And then you could just keep messing with that until you have it with no black borders on either side. And it's a bit more representative of what it's supposed to look like. And then we could save the setting. But before I forget, there's another setting you want to have disabled, and that is in the system options under PS2 digital settings. Make sure you have extended input with disabled, otherwise you could get some really interesting results in certain titles. Also make sure your audio mode is set to SPDIF if you want to be using optical audio for pure digital audio output. And once you have everything set, the Retro Gem is now ready to play nice with the Retro Tank 4K and give you a really good video and audio output. Now as for component video setup, just go ahead and open up the profiles menu on your Retro Tank 4K and you can head down to the PS2 category here. And Wobbling Pixels has made a number of awesome PS2 profiles for us to use. So for today's video, I'm using PS2 display aspect ratio 4x3 sharp. So as with other Wobbling Pixel profiles, we're gonna load up the PS2 sharpness calibration profile here. And for the 640x240 display resolution of Mega Man X collection here, it didn't automatically zoom it, so I'm just gonna manually zoom this one myself. So we're just gonna just crank this sucker all the way up. There we go. And one of the nice things about the new Wobbling Pixels profile is we don't have to worry about decimation phases, so running auto phase is going to automatically take care of this for us. And so just gonna run auto phase until this is looking nice and sharp. So there we go. So according to the profile, we want a decimation phase of three and a sub phase of zero for Mega Man X4 here. So again, we shouldn't have to worry about the decimation phase, but the sub phase being zero is what we wanna make note of, so just gonna go ahead and back out of this, load up the profiles menu, go back down to PS2. Wobbling pixels, DAR four by three sharp. So it looks pretty good already. But anyway, advanced settings, RGB component ADC, 
And there you go. As you can see, it already auto set the decimation to three of four, which is what we saw in the calibration we did. And the subphase is already set to zero. So this one is perfectly calibrated for our needs for the Mega Man X collection. And you're gonna wanna do this for all the different resolutions that the PS2 has on offer. So 480i, 480p, 1080i, if you're doing Gran Turismo 4 in that resolution. And one thing I almost forgot to mention, since we are using optical audio for today's video, we wanna head into the advanced settings, head down to the audio input tab, and set our input override over to SPDIF so that way we get nice clean digital audio for our component video source. But once you've done the calibrations on all the different resolutions, we are set to enjoy the PS2 library to its fullest. But for other settings for today's video, we're also using GenLock for our sync lock method with VRR enabled. But now for our showdown between the PS2 Retro Gem in direct mode versus official Sony component cables with optical audio running through the RetroTINK 4K. Take a look, see what you think.
that from your mama's side of the family? Cut the chatter. First enemy wave bearing 280 degrees. You are cleared to engage on site. It's too risky to put the nuggets here.
You always were the heroine. You know me? Aren't you my brother? Everything is mine.
The situation is normal. All clear. World soldier, nothing else to report. Counter DM and your request. Ah. 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 So what'd you think? Could you tell a lot of differences between these four test games that we showed off today? If your answer is no, that's okay because there really aren't a lot of differences and that's kind of the whole point of this video is to show that you don't need to blow a lot of money on HDMI mods to get a fantastic experience out of a PS2 especially. So four are slight differences that are available between HDMI and component video. Let's take a look at them. So, first of all, the benefit of having an HDMI mod is that you reduce analog signal noise in solid colors. So if we zoom in on Mega Man X2 here, you can see that, hey, look at that, the background is more solid with less analog noise. That is pretty much our only benefit to having an HDMI mod in a PS2. Because again, PS2 has digital audio output already, so that's not even a benefit. Get that on either one. But the downside of the gem, we still have some cropping issues popping up on the left side of the screen even after doing some calibrations. So look at the door here on Mega Man X2 for an easy comparison here. Otherwise, the experience you're getting out of both is roughly 99.9% .9 the exact same thing. So if you want to spend an extra $75 to $150 to get a PS2 HDMI mod over a $30 HD retrovision cable. I mean, more power to you. But as you can see, there's hardly any benefit of doing so. Now, normally here is where I would mention that you could also use HDMI mods in a standalone function and get some added use out of them that way to take them places without extra scalar equipment and setup required. But for the PS2 Retro Gem, I'm still very unhappy with its overall performance as an HDMI mod compared to what we see on other systems. And the reason for this is that PS2 is mostly a 480i system, and Pixel FX 480i deinterlacing is just still not up to snuff. I've been covering since I got the gem in the RetroTINK 4K that the motion adaptive deinterlacing is just not very good. It's been patched a couple of times that has made it worse, and then kind of returned it to the way it was to begin with. And things like Bob deinterlacing and the CRT simulate mode, just, they're not implemented correctly. So while you can take the PS2 and hook it up to other displays without needing a scaling setup, you are doing so in an inferior manner. And even a TV's built-in deinterlacer might actually do better in this regard on certain sets. Not all, but yeah, I'm just... Direct mode has finally made it, so it's pretty nice to pair with the RetroTINK 4K in most instances, but standalone mode still leaves a lot to be desired. But for one last comparison for you all, what about PS1 games running on a PS2 through the Retro Gem and component cables? Let's take a look at one very specific example. Namaste. You can't give it up! Triumph or die! Yeah. You love Yunga! <laughs> 
What differences did you spot that time? Hardly anything again? Yeah, there's really not much difference again. It's the same stuff. You get a little bit of image noise and the analog signal. Other than that, it's almost identical. But one thing, and this is why I chose Street Fighter Alpha 3 for our example game here, is that 384 mode games are still being cropped to 368 by the Retro Gem. A fix has been implemented for the actual PS1 hardware, but for the PS2 side of things, it's still not implemented. So hopefully we can see that soon. But again, just not enough of a difference over component in my mind to even worry about it, honestly. So after everything you've seen and heard, what would I recommend as the best way of hooking your PS2 up to the RetroTINK 4K? And my answer would be, for anyone just getting into the PS2 that might not have official cables, is to get the HD RetroVision cables for PS2 and 3. The build quality is insanely good, and you are going to get results that match what you've seen here today. And again, the PS2 cables are nicely priced at $29.99. If you would like to try to track down official PS2 component cables, they could usually be found on eBay around the $40 price range. So I often find them for around $40 or $45. But again, make sure you're actually getting Sony branded cables and not some of these cheap old school or other third party ones because the quality is sure to suffer. And if you would like to go with a SCART route, you could also pick up an RGB SCART cable from somewhere like Retro Access that it's of high quality and results should be, again, fairly similar. 
But regardless of which cable type you decide to go with, you will want to pair it with an optical cable so that way you can take advantage of the PS2's digital audio out on the RetroTINK 4K. At this point, pretty much anything you can pick up from Amazon is going to do the trick. But if you have your heart set on HDMI out into the RetroTINK 4K, the basic edition of the Retro Gem goes for $119, and if you can install it yourself, there you go. Otherwise, you will need to pay for an installer, and price only goes up from there. Now again, the standalone mode is not exactly my favorite thing in the world at the moment, but I'm sure patches will appear that will fix all the lingering issues that I still have with it, so it can still be a valid use case down the road, but to take most advantage of that, you do have to pay for the shiny edition, and that brings the price up to $189.99, and when paired with an installer, it just is quite a price to pay to get minorly better video out out of the PS2. And it is also worth noting that not every version of the PS2 can even support the Retro Gem as of this moment, so do pay attention to the compatibility list before you decide to dive in. But there we have it, the last of the Pixel FX internal HDMI mods that we are discussing as part of this video series as of now. We're going to be back next time with other companies' HDMI mods and putting them through the same battery of tests. And honestly, the results for most are exactly the same as you've seen week after week here, with a few exceptions. But thank you so much as always for watching today's video. I hope it helps inform you as to which video option you want to use when pairing it with the RetroTINK 4K and just weighing some of the pros and cons, prices, and different things like that. But big thank you to everyone for watching. Just the usual favorites here at the end as always. Thumbs up, thumbs down, depending on how much you like this one. Sub button, notification bell, so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. And if you'd like to support this channel, you could uh, check out that join button here on Patreon, YouTube, and the Patreon link in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Little goes a long way to keeping us going, and we're super grateful to everyone who has done so. Thank you so much, champs. Could not do it without you. But until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming. We'll see you back next video.